All right, guys, welcome back. EYL, this is a very unique situation. Uh, I will explain later. Yeah. But uh, we are here with the podcast king, David yes, Shans. Crown. He put his crown on, y'all. Um, <laughs> social Proof Empire got the new studio mm-hmm. in Atlanta. Thank you for having us up there. You got your real estate place that you've been working on. You got the big event that you that you got coming up. You got an online community. You've taught a variety of different people how to actually get going in the podcast space, how to monetize the space. Mm-hmm. Um, but so let, yeah. me, let, yeah. me, let me just oh, wait before that. before you, he's still the first person that's ever done this, right? Nobody's ever done. Well, this. we're gonna explain this, but no, I'm not saying this. I'm talking about what he's done already with us. So you're the first person that we interviewed, and then you interviewed us. Yeah, <laughs> right after that's never happened. <laughs> for sure, for like sure. ever, that's never happened. So there's never I, been I, an episode. It's, it's happened before. Where? Uh, Envy. Did it multiple times? No, no, the same day. The same day. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, because yeah, I came to the kitchen table. <laughs> yeah. And then y'all interviewed me. Yeah. And I think we like switched seats or something. Like yeah, that. we just moved, we, we did musical chairs. <laughs> and then interviewed y'all. But I have to say this up front, man. Um, you all are one was the motivation. Like, I, I think I started podcasting before you, you guys, yep. but um, I remember we was at the Cheesecake Factory and I was having a conversation with uh, Troy, and he's like, "Man, I like your stuff, man. You just not cons- you, you you don't do it every week. It's not consistent." And I really took that to heart. I heard, bro. That next Monday on the morning meetup, I'm like, "Yo, y'all, I'm about to be consistent with this thing. I love doing it. Um, if I ever not drop an episode on Monday, I will come on this call and give away like two thousand dollars." Wow. That was I, yeah. I was offended because yeah. you didn't you didn't say it in an offensive way. But I was offended. But then also, um, let's talk about that moment for a moment. Because I, I saw you did reference that online. Yeah. Um, but what you didn't reference was that he did give you education after that. Yeah. So that, that was, yeah, that was, yeah, that was, I, that I, was, I, was, I, was, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it's just inconsistent. <laughs> you, you, yeah, <laughs> it was, when I saw the clip, I'm like, damn, all right, cool. But what it was, was like. I had used you as a reference before, mm-hmm. right? So I think we were interviewing Alex at the time, mm-hmm. and I was trying to find information about information about him. And it was your interview. I'm like, yo, this guy's great. And so when I when I saw you, I'm like, yo, you know, like you're really great at this. Mm-hmm. But the only thing is that you don't do it enough. Yeah. Like it's kind of like it, you drop it, and it was like it wasn't even a challenge. It was like, yo, this is just like positive yeah. critique. And then we had a longer conversation because we went back to another time. We went back to Jeremy Anderson's house, and I was like, well, let me tell you, in yeah, that moment, yeah, in that moment, it sort of felt like. I don't even remember anything you said after. <laughs> like keeping it really, that, I didn't, I, that I didn't stuck eat my in my food. mind. I'm like I'm in a space with some people that do the same thing, and they're recognizing my inconsistency, and I took it personally. I yeah. needed it, yeah. of course. Not that you said anything bad. I said okay. I I gotta be consistent. Then later on, this is more flowers. Uh, we're gonna do a bouquet here. Ah, uh, here we go. Um. Uh. I, really started educating me on the podcasting space and uh, joined the Earning Leisure Network. And like just to, just one, being able to um, have proximity, I never, ever want to take that for granted. Like you guys are like literally paving a way and have given me so much game, so much information. And I, I can honestly say I wouldn't know half the stuff that I, I know right now, even to teach other people, if it wasn't for you all. Half of it, you are directly saying, this is what you need to do. Mm. The other half is watching and modeling. So it's it's been an incredible, incredible journey, even knowing y'all. So Appreciate um, that. Yeah, for sure. Appreciate for sure, that, man. for sure. And like, um, it's been great to see your growth as well. Yeah. You know, and consistency, I think another person that wasn't the most consistent, it was 19 Keys. He had a show. People forget, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. high-level conversations took over the world and, you know, gets 10 million views every episode he puts out. But yeah. People don't forget that he had he had a show before high level conversation, and that was one of the main issues was the level of consistency. So, yeah. so here's, here's the crazy part: the same conversation I had with you, I had with him. Really, same thing. And he was like, "All right, let's just do this then. Right, let's just do this then." Yeah. <laughs> and like, obviously, what, what the success it had now was just incredible. But it was yeah. it was like you just see that like the talent is there, yeah. the message is there, the pack, everything was there. It was like this is that one piece. How are we gonna do it? And 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 everybody can see what it turned out to be now. How many millionaires can come from the UIL tree? <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting quote. I thought about that quote. Yeah. Yeah, because most people how do we quantify it? Like some people can look at the artists that they've signed and how you know their careers have gone, but 
Yeah. How do we reach? How do you know the everyday person that got information and now has become a millionaire? For sure, I think y'all hit it from three sides too. One is the common listener, right? Uh, multiple sides. One is the common listener, the information that you guys put out, right? They can take that information, and you can't quantify how many people have made millions from that, right? The second part is the people that have been on the show, mm -hmm. being able to share with the audience. They became millionaires from their notoriety, from like you guys giving them the platform. I think three is your 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 circle of, um, and I would be one mentees, right? People that have you you've taught the game. Mm. Maybe they're not they weren't on the show, or maybe they're not like the listener, but people that you've taught the game to. And I think for your whole team of people that your collaborations, partnerships, right? So it's going to be very difficult to quantify the success, you know what I mean? Like even yeah. on, like, let's say like Bad Boy, you could say, okay, well, 112 became successful, Mary J, all these people, but th the impact is different from what y'all doing. So I figure it's proper to spend a few minutes. <laughs> Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Y'all don't, don't get the credit, man. Nobody, and I was saying it, uh, complex, that complex list, it's so faulty. Cause you can't, I know your argument is like, well, it's for hip hop, but who's more hip hop? Like, Who's interviewed more um, um, celebrities from the hip hop culture and figured out how they became a celebrity than y'all? They go on radio runs on their album that's coming out, their movie that's coming out, but nobody's understanding the backing on how they became that, right? So y'all not be on the list is disrespectful. Nobody on that list has made a person a dime. Nobody on that list has put 14,000 people in a stadium, just y'all. What are we talking about right nah. now? Can't <laughs> argue with you. Can't argue with you, man. You got a point there, Dave. You got a point. <laughs> you're right. Appreciate you're right. that, man. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that, man, for sure. For sure. But you know, people norm normalize greatness. And I think 19 Keys has spoken about that before. But it's like sometimes when you see things, it's, it's hard to have an appreciation for it because it just becomes normal, mm -hmm. right? Like when you accomplish amazing things on a consistent basis, that's, that's the problem with consistency. Mm -hmm is that it desensitizes us, mm. right? Like if a player just drops 40 points and you never heard of him ever in his life, right. it's like, yo, that's crazy. If LeBron dropped 40 points, it's just a regular day, right? You right. know what I'm saying? So it's like, we've we've normalized greatness. And I think that that's something that is difficult because it's like, yeah, to be able to accomplish a variety of different things, whether it's going and sell out two shows in Toronto and Royal Lava Hall in London and 14,000 people at Invest Fest and a variety of different things that we've been able to accomplish. Even if you look at EYO Network, I mean, it really, if you look at it from an independent standpoint, like we have more shows on the charts than on CNBC or any mm -hmm. like major, like, you know, when you look at Market Mondays, Earn Your Leisure, High Level Conversations, just those three. Yeah, You'd be hard pressed to find any podcast network anybody across any genre that has three shows that are that successful yeah. Yeah. or even just three shows right because a lot of them just don't have a the network they don't even have any shows. But i'm just yeah. saying it, yeah. th there are podcast networks but yeah. i don't know any podcast network that has that kind of roster yeah so but you know it is what it is you know yeah. it's just you just keep keep the ball rolling and keep going yeah but the greatness isn't even normalized yet because you guys are doing amazing things and it's just not enough people talking about it. You know what I mean? When LeBron goes out and drops 40, it becomes normal, but you're like, yo, we know that this person is great, but y'all dropping 40 every week and <laughs> nobody's saying anything. Like, I, I mean, it, it's based on what we're doing, right? Like, no, they're not expecting this. This is, this is built around business. It's built around entrepreneurship. It's built around finance and investing. It's not built around athletics. It's not built around specifically music. And so it's tough because it's not common nature in our yeah. community, right? These conversations don't happen. So it's still like almost like a foreign language that's penetrating the mainstream. But the yeah. more that people do talk about it, and I, we had that conversation about showing up in these places where all these people are that are doing those things, it becomes like, wait, these guys are here again? They're here yeah. again? They're here again? What's happening right now, yeah. right? And so we're just trying to penetrate the, the masses with the message. And again, eventually it'll, it'll be commonplace and that's the goal. Yeah, I wanna know, um... When did you know you were making an impact, though? I mean, you know you're doing it online, but yeah. at some point you said, well, we want to put all these people in one room. When did you know, okay, it's time to just come out of the living room 
and really let's let's let, let's bring people together. I think it was our first networking event in LA. Mm -hmm. um, like after like episode fourteen, we was in LA. Decided to do a last minute networking event, and um, really last minute, like decided to do it on Friday, and it was on a Monday. Really? Yeah, and it was in Carson, California, which is like out the way. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. What yeah. made you think this was going to be successful? Well, honestly, that, that inspiration came from Matt. Matt was doing a network. He did a networking event in Atlanta randomly. You know, I saw it on Instagram. I'm like, oh, that's dope. Are you doing a networking event? We should do one. We in LA. Like, uh, so it's like, we just put it together and um, put it on Instagram. A restaurant owner reached out to us and let us use his spot. Mm -hmm. It was all like within 48 hours of putting it together, um, put a flyer up on Instagram, created an event bright, and people came. So it was like, you know, probably like 100, 150 people that came. Really? Mm -hmm. And um, people came from like San Diego, IE, like they was coming from like two different two hours away. And it was on a Monday at like five o'clock, like terrible traffic in LA. And um, that was like, you know, impactful because the love was just there. Like, you know, you had all different type of people from different walks of life. That was the first event that we did where people actually met us in person mm -hmm. and was like, you know, championing us and like, you know, I, I rock with y'all. I I had did Matt event before that. Matt had a real estate event. And this is where we met a lot of different people like Sabine and Miss Business and stuff like that. But um, that was like the first time since the show had started, that was like around episode six. Mm -hmm. And there was people rocking with it from then. So when I did that, people was coming up to me. Like, yo, I rock with your show. I love your show, da, da, da. And that was like episode six. So a few weeks later, we did our own event. And that was the first time where we got to connect with people in person. And, um, you know, once you once you see that happen, mm -hmm. it's like, all right, we on to something. Yeah, it's interesting because it was like, let's maximize the time. We were initially going out to L.A. because we had just uh, confirmed Al Harrington. And this was a big deal. It was like, yo, we got Al Harrington. You know, we grew up watching him play. Shotty had a relationship with him or met him um, early in his in his, his uh, basketball career. So it was like, oh, this is gonna be great. We can talk about cannabis. And the illest thing was like, all right, well, if we're gonna be out there, let's maximize the time, let's do that. Let's put a networking event together to see if people show up. And I remember being at the networking event and at the time I'm still teaching. I'm like, yo, I gotta catch this plane. I can't, I can't even, <laughs> I can't stay the whole time, right? Like I'm still like, yo, this is, I, this is great with meeting people, but I can't stay. So I actually, I think I left like an hour early to get back on the plane to come to New York. I was like, this is crazy. So that was a moment, but I think after that, it was like, yo, we got something. But then when we did it in New York, yeah. we did one in Brooklyn at BK9. And when we pulled up, it was packed. Really? Like the restaurant was packed. We were walking up. I had I had Ab with me and um, Zay, Mike's niece. Uh, we had we were doing another, we were doing our summer program. So yo, come with me to this event. And we're walking up and they're looking at me like, it's Troy. Yeah. Like, it's Troy. We're just All going right. with him to Brooklyn. And we're walking up and people are like, yo, I, I just took the bus from Philly to come see you. Yo, I live in Rhode Island. I came down here just to see y'all. And they're looking at me like, wait, what? And I'm like, yo, this is crazy. This is turning into something. And then when we what we saw inside of that, that, that restaurant that night was pockets of information. And so, you know, we had somebody talking about stocks and people were surrounding around them because they wanted to hear the information. Derek Falcon, who had just did episode 11, was talking about, you know, his episode. And we were just watching this happen. Like, yo, this is it. Like everybody's just gravitating around the information they want to know. And we packed out the spot in Brooklyn. This is going to be crazy. Like even in the intro for every episode, mm -hmm. the clips from that event are part of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, was, it was it was a major thing for us. What made what made Earn Your Leisure so special though? You know what I mean? I'm like episode six, you're talking about episode 11, episode 14, and people are coming out. And there are a lot of people that maybe they're talented, but it's taking them 60 up. My, my joint ain't start rocking to like 50. What's going on, y'all? That's right. The biggest event in business is upon us. Invest Fest 2023 is here, August 25th through the 27th, Atlanta, Georgia. Y'all know who's coming, but bigger than that. Shadi, tell them what they're going to learn. Yes, you will learn about AI. You will learn about crypto. You will learn about stocks. You will learn about real estate. You will learn about merchandise. You will learn about everything you need to know to be a successful entrepreneur and investor. And you will learn from some of the most successful people in the world. Billionaires like Robert Smith, 
billionaires like Michael Novogratz and so much more. We have Rich Paul. We have Steve Harvey. We have Tabidi Stevens. We have the master investor himself. We have 19 Keys. The list goes on. This is going to be an event that you cannot afford to miss. That's right. So head over to investfest.com and get your tickets right now. What? I think we had a, so we had a head start. We was doing social media. I was doing social media for two years before we had Earn Your Leisure. So we didn't we didn't just start with zero. Yeah. There was anticipation for Earn Your Leisure. Before. That's the whole reason why we started Earn Your Leisure, mm-hmm. because the anticipation had been building so much. Everybody was DMing like, where's your show? Where do I watch it? Where do I? So it was like, all right, the the demand was already there. Yeah. So it was like, you know, when we opened the, the gates, we already had thousands of people that was willing to just walk into the house as opposed to just trying to build the house and then like market it like, hey, come over here. So that was definitely a part of it. But also I think the packaging, it was just a good time. But the the, the packaging was different as far as um, mixing the sports and entertainment and pop culture and blending it with business, you know, kind of adding all of the elements from the slang fashion, you know, different things that we was doing as far as how we was curating the stories, telling stories related to business. And that was something that was like really just interesting. Social media definitely played a big part because a lot of those clips was going viral early. Mm -hmm. Like early, we did a clip about like George Foreman. um, That was crazy. And the George Foreman grill and Hulk Hogan. That went viral. Mm -hmm. Soldier Boy. Amazon. Uh, That was was like on episode one. So from the beginning, but like I said, there was clips going viral before that. But once we started, you know, it seemed like everything that we would put out would just go viral on social media. So it was one of those things people see on Explore Play, like, what's this? So they was just tapping in. So fortunately for us, we never really had to try to um, build the audience because mm-hmm. the audience was already built. Like, that was the hard part, trying to figure it out two years prior. Mm-hmm. Was like, how do, you, how do you get people to engage with your content? How do... But that was already figured out by the time we figured, we already had a two year head start. By the time we Earn Your Leisure came, it wasn't really trying to figure out how to make a clip or how to put a title on a video or how to make it engaging because it was already tried and tested for 24 months previously. So by the time Earn Your Leisure came, it was already like a, a, a thing where we know like, all right, this is, this is what's going to hit. This is going to explode. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, I think I had, Anything to do with timing? Everything. Of course. Time is everything. Of course. Yeah. It, it, a lot of it has to do with timing. I, I always credit, you know, Dame's 2015 Breakfast Club interview and how that impacted me and how it, how it felt when he was talking about being an entrepreneur and talking about legacy and talking about that generational but sustainable wealth. It was like, man, here I am in this nine, to, like this seven to three. Was that the first back and forth conversation that the world had around entrepreneurship versus job? It, it may not be. Our, our culture. For us. It yeah. was the most impactful. Yeah. I don't know if it was the first, but it was the most impactful. It, yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it hit home. It hit home. Like I'm a teacher and I'm watching this yeah. and I'm watching like he was an entrepreneur, Mike was an entrepreneur and I'm the teacher. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, yo, damn. Like I remember my pops working for 40 years, but I knew that didn't guarantee me an interview at the place he worked. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yo, damn. Like this school is not even named after me. What am I giving to the next generation? It's like, this is tough. Right. And then Jay came with in 2017 with the 444 album. And with huge, I'm a huge Jay-Z fan. And what he was talking about was legacy. Like he has a song called Legacy, right? And then he has the story of OJ and like everything around it was surrounded around financial literacy. And it was like, great. At the time, even prior to that, like I was, we were writing lessons in a program, but they were based around the lyrics that were in hip hop. Mm. And so we're teaching through music, but we're teaching financial literacy through it. So it was like, all those things happened at the same time. It was like perfect melting pot for this to happen. Mm. And I think you guys even started crossing over, like really the first people to find celebrities, artists, and start finding out the business behind the stuff that they were doing. And I think some people might look at it like, oh man, I missed the boat. Uh, everyone's been interviewed already. Everyone's doing it. But you guys keep finding the perfect timing, mm. like the perfect timing for exposing entrepreneurship from a, celebrity standpoint, bringing people together, right? Like yeah. you guys keep finding the right time. But I think right? even before it's a celebrity, it's your next door neighbor. Yeah. right. <laughs> your next door neighbor could be the millionaire yeah. and you'd have no idea if they never got to tell their story. We interviewed Derek Ferguson, who's a close friend. He was a CEO of Bad Boy, CFO of Bad Boy for 20 years. 
He, I went to church with this guy for 10 years. Mm -hmm. When we did his interview, he's like, this is the first time somebody's asked me, actually asked me what I did for a living. Wow. He's been in this space for 20 years, right? He's seen from Bad Boy to Surat, like he's seen all these things revolt. He's been there. Nobody's ever asked him. And I was like, wait, nobody's ever asked him? You got so much information. Because the chances of somebody being you are highly likely. The chances of somebody being puff is going to be tough. Yeah. Right? And so it was like the, the real estate attorney or the real estate agent, the, the tax uh, professional, right? All these people are entrepreneurs and creating businesses that you actually need that you should know about because there's a, a, a great chance that you could actually do that and apply yeah. it into your everyday life. Then it was like, all right, once we built up that clientele, it was like, well, who's next? Yeah. Right? Can we get the celebrity? Right? We, we, we always talk about this network across, right? Because if you network across long enough, like that person might introduce you to the next person you're looking for, right? So you start at this level and then you build up and build up. And then when you get the celebrity, it's like, all right, well, let's pull back the layers. Because like you said, most people go on interviews because they have something to promote. But most times, nobody asks them anything about the business, yeah. right? Everybody's getting paid for their profession or they're making money from it. But how are you doing it? Because that's the important part. Like we see people doing it. They never told us how. And maybe because they didn't know or they just didn't feel confident enough to talk about it. But that, that's what this was. Like it felt like, all right, let's humanize this as much as we can. Let's see how much information they're willing to share. Because number one, it can help from the lessons that they learn. Or number two, it can inspire somebody to do something different. For sure. I think you guys are creating the right timing. It's like when y'all do something <laughs> and then everybody starts doing it. And they say, well, it was the right timing. No, he I that. created this. <laughs> yeah, that's that shoddy line. Like, yo, <laughs> they start copying, no, reinvest something new. Yeah. For the first Invest Fest, 4,000 people. Um, it has to be kind of nerve wracking because this, this is one of the few things that you can't hide the success or failure, right? So if I drop a book, Nobody knows how many I sold. You know what I mean? Like, if I drop a podcast, really nobody knows how many downloads I got, right? But a live event is the one thing you cannot hide. If there's no one there, I mean, you, you got to put people to the front so the, the camera looks good. Yeah. But 4,000 people, which is absolutely incredible, years ago, where did this thought come from? And that was a lot. So, <laughs> it, all right. So, um, Definitely got to give a big shout out to uh, him for 100. Mm -hmm. Went to his event in Miami, and that was the first time that we saw something like that, like the, the level of production, and especially for our culture, but probably just in general, because I don't know, for me personally, I didn't go to any like business conferences like that. So we were inspired by that. Like, yo, we got to do something like, but. How many people were at that event? I think, think it was like 2,000, something yeah, yeah. like 2,000. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was just for his community, recession proof. Um, so, but me, I'm very big on taking inspiration, but not copying. Yeah. It's two different things. Like, you know what I mean? We all get inspired for everything. I might be like, oh, that's a dope hoodie. Like, I want to rework it. I don't want to take your hoodie and, you know, <laughs> just put our logo on it. Right. That's copying. But being inspired by something is different. So I've been inspired by everything from art, music, everything. So we were inspired, but we didn't want to copy. So it was like, all right, well, how do we make it different? How do we do an event? But we need to do an event. We got a lot of momentum. A lot of people like us. Like we want, we want to do an event bigger because we did our first event at Yes Spot actually. Mm -hmm. So we were doing events, then the pandemic shut it down. So it was like this would be the first event after the pandemic. But we want to rebrand it. We don't want to do like the same thing that we did before the pandemic. Which before the pandemic, the formula was a two day event, and it would be the first day, like a Saturday, it would be a live podcast, mm -hmm. and then on Sunday it was an education seminar. Right. And that's what we did. We did it in DC. We did it in Atlanta. And then we were about to do it in Philly. And then we had COVID came and shut it down. Mm. So it was like, all right, we got to do something. We got to look to scale. So understand words is very important. So um, festival, the idea of festival, I'm like, we need to have a festival. And, you know, past festival, a lot of times people look at festival like, it has to be outside. Mm -hmm. But I looked up the, the dictionary word and it never says in the dictionary a festival has to be outside. It's what are just, the characteristics? Um, I could look at it and see. I'm not 100% sure, mm -hmm. but it doesn't say outside. Right. I think that's just kind of been associated mm -hmm. because a, a lot of festivals are outside. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's just been associated with it, right? Mm -hmm. So, but it didn't have to be called a festival. It didn't have to be outside to be a festival. Right. So, just thinking about it, it was like, all right, well, 
it's difficult to do what we do outside yeah. for a variety of different reasons. If you take the elements of it might rain and stuff like that, but just to get people's attention, like you got to actually be able to sit down and learn for hours at a time. Right. And standing outside doesn't really lend itself to that. Mm -hmm. It's good for music when you just halfway listening, halfway drunk, like, you know, <laughs> that's not that's not the most right. important thing. But it's like when you actually are have to pay attention to something, yeah. it's better in a closed setting. Yeah. So it's like that's kind of a hurdle. But what would also add to a festival feel? Mm -hmm. So when you start thinking about festivals, it's like what's the what are in festivals? So food trucks, yeah. right? Like that's part of a festival feel. So I was like, all right, well, what if we can add food trucks to it and have like a culinary experience? Mm -hmm. And then it's like, all right, been the essence, once again, drawing inspiration. And so what they did with their vendor marketplace right. and like Essence Fest, that's one of the biggest festivals for our culture. So it was like, all right, well, at that time, nobody was doing vendor marketplaces for their events. And other people have like a vendor marketplace, but it was just like their booths yeah. promoting their products, which is fine. But nobody had done it where it was like outside businesses could set up shop. Yeah. So it was like, oh, this is an opportunity to do that. So now you got two things. You got the vendor space, which is that's a festival type of feel. Mm -hmm. You got food trucks. That's a festival type of feel. And then the stuff that we were already currently doing with the live podcast, the sim like the, you know, the panel discussions and stuff like that. We were already familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, all right, well, entertainment is always a big part of it. So now if we can add an entertainment factor to it, so that's where the musicians come in. So now mm -hmm. it's like now we have a headliner performer or we have, you know, for VIP night, we have a performer for that, right? So now you add the music part of it, which every festival pretty much has some level of music entertainment part of it. So and then it was like, what what do we call it? And then you know, going back and forth with names for a long time. And then invest fest. Mm -hmm. Feel like that you really can't come up with a better name than that, yeah. right? Like invest fest. It's short, simple, conveys the message. Yeah. Very easy to put on a shirt and for people to remember. It rhymes. Yeah. Invest fest. Um, it's a bar. It rhymes, and that's <laughs> and and that's that's how it was done. Yeah, that's yeah. that's that's how that's that's kind of how it how it it came to yeah. fruition. And it was never a thing of of being fear, right? Like we never operate in fear. We operate in like, all right, let's see what we can do next. And so, like, even the title of the name, it was about it not being about us, mm -hmm. right? So that alleviates any type of fear because it really wasn't about us. You think about, it, we could have named it. The Ernie Leisure Fest, but we yeah, didn't. Sure. It was really about the people. Even like from the marketplace standpoint, it was like, yeah, some people had promoted themselves, but it was like, you know, let's let the community be part of it. Because even our episodes, right? We could have just st stayed it just being me and Shadi doing episodes. Yeah. It was like, nah, let's figure out how many people can we can highlight their greatness. Mm -hmm. And so all the episodes become like monumental because it was highlighting greatness, right? Even from a standpoint, it was like, all right, well, if it's not about us, we know what we're gonna do. We do this every day. We can, you know, we're gonna find somebody to interview. But it was like. We have a network. Yeah. Let's highlight them. Right? So if Dave Shan's on network, let's have him have a panel. If MG's on, you know what I'm saying? So it was like highlighting everything that was going on outside of just the people that they see and associate with the brand. It was like, no, this is a brand. This is its own IP. And this is about the people. So the marketplace becomes that. The food trucks become that. Mm -hmm. The community that comes inside of it becomes that. Because it's, it's, it's more than just a festival where people are going to come and gather and listen to people. It's like, nah. This could be your next business partner you're sitting next to. For sure. Right? You could you could find somebody here, your next person to invest in your business. Whereas we didn't see that. We were inspired by other people, but it was like, all right, this would be, be we can improve on what this is because it's missing that. You know what I mean? The, but gotcha. that's the most, I think the most important thing is the name. Is it? In my opinion. Because like I said, just that it, it, it breaks the mold of what it, there's a lot of conferences. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of symposiums, conferences, different things of that nature. No, to my knowledge, nobody has ever named something that is business related a festival. So doing that already sends shockwaves through the system. You think so? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yo, I was actually on a, a panel and I was like, I was I was making the point like that the show or the product makes the name. 
the name. Like people want to think of a perfect name, but it like it, none of us would have thought, yo, we're gonna have uh, all these products in one place, and we're gonna call it Walmart. Well, I think I think they go hand in hand. Mm. So the name is extremely important because that's the first thing people see. Mm. That's what gets them in the door. But it's like if you walk in a house with no furniture, nothing, you're not you're gonna walk right out. Right. Yeah, true. So it got it now. Once the house is fully decorated and it's crazy Art Deco and art and all that, now you're interested in staying. Yeah, it's like it's like when you hear Rolling Loud before you knew what it was, mm-hmm. you knew you knew what the name, yeah. right? Like Coachella, we didn't know exactly what's happening, but you knew the name. Even like with Jay, what he did with Made in America, it was like, what's he doing with that? What what is this right. going to be? True. Right. You know what so I'm saying? like. I'm, one, I didn't know what earn your leisure meant for like a year. And I'm talking about, I already know, I already knew you guys for that long. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't know. That, I mean, is it is it you come up with a name where people get it or it's the I mystique think, I think it? I think, it goes, so, so for Invest Fest, like I said, and this is why, like, I was really adamant. I, like, in festival, I thought was very important mm. because the word festival, now you got to live up to create a festival. <laughs> you just can't name it a festival and have it in your backyard. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, now that that forces you yeah. to think outside the box and to be original and to add different elements to it yeah. as opposed to just having a seminar. Yeah. And it's not going to feel the same, right? If, we, if you named it a conference, you've probably been to a bunch of those, yeah. right? When you hear festivals, it's like, oh, what, they're doing something different. Automatically, they're doing something different. Mm. I need to change the name of my summit. <laughs> <laughs> We're not doing conferences and summits. We're going to change the whole day. Like, I got a trademark, too. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, let me ask you this. 4,000 people first time, right? Yeah. This one. Did you know you were going to have 4,000 people before you did it? Or it just so happened y'all had 4,000? Like, what was the number when you, nah, when you that, start coming so together? When you, when you do these type of events, especially like where we do it at, like, you, you have to have seating for a certain amount of people. So it's like seating chart. So it's like, all right, you know, the seating for 3,500, 4,000, whatever that is. And then you can, as you get closer, you trying to see, maybe we need to take some seats away because we're not going to hit this number. Or mm-hmm. we can add, but it's kind of difficult to change that. So you you kind of go into it with a set target right? of like what you, what you want to hit and try to accomplish that goal. So gotcha. that was a, a target. Around, I don't know the exact number that we targeted, but it was it wasn't just a random thing, like because yeah. it's like you might if if it's if you set the room for a thousand people and then you tell them we got four thousand, it can't happen. Mm-hmm. Like it has to be set for the expectations that you're giving them. Like you got to give the venue expectations. Like this is how many people we got to have, because then they got to send the plans to the fire marshal. Yeah. They got to they got to you know bring the walls in and and put the chairs in and it's a variety of things. How but you got and, and remember, like where at the we t- get in the number from to even look for a venue that holds this amount of people. So it's the analytics, right? It's the reason why when we look at it, it's like we could do it in New York. That's our biggest audience, but right now it's during COVID. So at the time we couldn't do anything in New York. Mm-hmm. So it was like, well, where's the next biggest audience that we have? Oh, Atlanta. Okay, bet. So now we, we look at it that, and then there's certain like restrictions that we couldn't do because it was it was COVID at the time. But it was like, all right, well, we saw what an event looked like when we went to Miami. Yeah. With, with him for 100, shout out to him again. Like, all right, well, if they can do that, and we, I feel like our audience has grown to a point, I think we could maybe, let's try to double that. Got so it. you got a baseline, right. based on your analytics, plus your reach, plus what you know can be done. It's like, you've seen in the past, like, all right, this feels like a, a number that I think is obtainable for us to yeah. do. But also, it's, it's the eye test, but it's also testing the waters. So even when we was doing free networking events, like that kind of gives us an idea. So like the London is, is a perfect example. InvestFest Europe. So we did InvestFest Europe in London last year at Royal Albert Hall. Mm-hmm. So Royal Albert Hall is one of the most prestigious venues in the world. And it holds 4,500 people. So you don't just guess. Like you don't want to just, no, I'm being honest. Cause like people might be listening. They might be like, it's like, sure. oh, I'm booking Madison Square Garden. And then it's like, you know what I'm saying? Like you don't want to just book crypto arena and then right. it's like a hundred people. It, so it, there's there's a science to it, but it's not a set science. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a feeling that you have. It is an eye test feeling, but I think you also have to do other events to work your way up to that. So mm-hmm. before we did the Royal Albert Hall, we did a free event in London, free networking event, and 2,500 people came 
to a venue that held 300 and it was 2,000 people on the street. So that that gave us a feeling mm-hmm. that there was a, a high demand in London. And with enough time and enough marketing, we we felt confident yeah. that we could fill up Royal Albert Hall. It's never a guarantee. Oh, yeah. You don't know. 300 people? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was crazy. But that, that's, I mean, even that, to that point, it was like, yeah, Atlanta. Our first event was in Atlanta. How many tickets did we sell? All right, let's look at the analytics for that. Yeah, we did a network event. All right, how many people showed up? You know what I mean? Like, we, we started to see these things, and it was like, all right, this makes sense. We can we can get this done here. So the last event that we did, we was, the Atlanta event that we did at Just Spot, we did like 500 people, right? Mm-hmm. And that was, then we took like 18 months because of COVID, took off. And then we came back, and we saw like him fine. It had almost 2,000 people in his event. So I was like, all right, well, if we did 500 almost two years ago, he has 2,000, you know, we kind of know Atlanta's a very good market for us. Mm-hmm. So you start playing around the numbers in your head. Like, you know, it's still, like I said, it's still not a set science because you don't know. Anything is possible. For sure. People might not come. You know what I'm saying? It's always a risk when you're doing an event. Did we ever have a feeling? Like, did you ever, anybody ever feel, especially like you lost the not, tickets? Yeah, not, not that they're not going to come, but again, this is like, this is 20, 21, right? So like even I, I I got COVID. Like even though leading up to it, I was sick. Like it was a chance that I might not even made it to the first semester. You remember that? So it was like I didn't think that people wouldn't come. I just want, didn't know if people felt safe enough to come. Mm-hmm. There was a little of that, you know what I mean? Because it was yeah. like we still didn't know. Like there was still a high in the season where it was like, I'm not sure. Do I want to risk my health or get this information? Yeah. And so if people had to put that in their mind. It was like there's some doubt. But you know, we were looking at it when we were leading up to it. I'm just like. Nah, this is happening. Yeah. And then it became like, you know, Shadi was down here a week early. Ad was out here. Mike was already out here. I was like, there's no way I'm missing this. If these people are coming, <laughs> right. I'm not missing this. <laughs> All, right. All right. So first event, 4,000 people, amazing success. What'd you do wrong? The first one. Um, I'm not just not necessarily sure we did anything wrong. It was just a short amount of time. It was like six weeks from... Start to finish as far as, so, you know, it's, it's six weeks. Yeah. You yeah. Start so I'm going to map this out, right? So him for hundreds event was in April of that year. Mm-hmm. So like you're drawing inspiration from there, <laughs> right? And you're like, oh wait, okay. Yeah, we can do this. And the, I remember we had a conversation. He was like, yo, we, are we going to do this? And I think it probably was like May. He was like, oh, we, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. It was a group chat. Group so I, I said, I got, I got an idea. That was like in end of May, June. We didn't really formalize the plan to like, until yeah, like June. June. Yeah. And it was, it was, <laughs> it was like, like, yo, guys. First, first week of August. Are we going to do this or not? And it was like, all right, let's do this. What we need to do. So, but I mean, <laughs> given the circumstances, I think we did pretty good. So I don't necessarily look at it like what we did wrong. It's just what, what can you add? Yeah. Even this year, like every year, it's like, look to see, okay, what could we add? Yeah. What was missing, what could have made it an even better experience. Yeah. So that's kind of what I think is a better way to kind of frame it of like, what's a better experience, a better, you know, user vibe as opposed to just kind of keeping the same thing going yeah. year after year. So every detail, right? Like you're looking at everything from, again, your analytics, right? Was was our ticket pricing incorrect? Was our VIP venue correct? Can we make it better? How, do, how can we make it bigger? How do we make the experience for, you know, the person who's coming as grand as possible? How do we make it as impactful as possible? Hold that thought. Yeah. When you're thinking about, okay, one is, okay, the the workshops, but like when you start curating a feeling that you want people to have, mm-hmm. do y'all consider that? Like, yeah. is that something that you're mapping out on a whiteboard? I want people to like feel this when they leave. I don't, well, for me personally, it's not necessarily that, it's creating an experience because you really can't control how somebody feels, mm. but it's like you can control the experience that they get. And nine times out of 10, if you create an experience that's unique, that's the point of just creating a unique experience, mm. then it's gonna be a memorable moment. I think that's the most important thing, like just creating moments. Like It's like creating memorable moments that people really remember for a long period of time. Explain a moment from the first event. A moment like that you would, don't. You know, somebody was in the crowd, they're like, whoa, I won't forget this. It's a variety of different things that happen, but my brother Kenny Burns is here. That was a dope panel. Actually, uh, that was the, I think that was a keynote panel for that year when we had him, Jim Jones, 19 Keys style. It was a very eclectic group that was put together. But after that, Jim Jones did something that was really dope. 
where he walked the vendor market. He actually had a booth in the vendor marketplace. Mm -hmm. He had a crypto ATM machine and he walked the vendor marketplace. And that was the first celebrity that actually did that. Steve Harvey did it the next year and went crazy. <laughs> it went crazy, but that was a that was a dope moment. That's odd. Because no, um, are you asking for that, or they just he, decided to do it? For which one? Steve for Jim? Are you asking them oh. like, hey? Nah, Jim. Jim, Jim wanted. Did it. Well, Jim yeah. had an incentive to do it because he had a vendor. He he was a vendor. Right. Yeah. So it's right. like it was in his best interest to try to create buzz around his booth. Yeah. So um, SH was just kind of he wanted to do it. Yeah, that was just like Harvey. He wanted to do it. Okay, I know that I know that's your man's now. You know <laughs> so let's not SH us. I don't want to call him Steve <laughs> and just be super info. But yeah, SH, he he uh he heard about it, he saw the impact that it had, and he was like, I want to do it. Let's let's just go. Yeah. Um how it turned out was was it was that was a scene. Like you want to talk about moments? Yeah. That that was a moment. I think for the first one, um that's crazy. He didn't I thought he would mention that, but it was um I watched him go out there and interview by himself for the first time. First I was, time. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think so. As an your leisure, I was too sick to get up there. Like, I was backstage t popping pills and I'm watching and I'm trying to build up enough energy to go up there. And we sitting there and he's like, You coming? I'm like, I, I can't. I physically couldn't get up there. How'd you feel? Was it a. But was I, it a yeah, it was a, thing? Or? It was cool. It was cool. Yeah. And, but um, the impact of that interview, right? It was him, but it was Ryan Leslie. It was Ryan Leslie and, and, and Hill Harper. Harper. And like, dope. most people know Ryan Leslie from music. Yeah. But now nah, he's talking about how he invested. In Apple, yeah. and it's like it's a whole different feel. And I'm sitting back there, like, yeah. part of me is like, Damn, can I get up to get it? And it was like, <laughs> nah, let's just let him go, just let him go. This is great to watch. Yeah. So like, it was that moment. It was, you know, what I'm saying. So like, you yeah. these type of things you remember. I'm just like, yo, it's just crazy. Like, this is us. Yeah. I'm watching us on stage. Like, this is us. This is our thing. Earners, what's going on? Listen, EYLU is relaunching, revamping, retooling. That's right, we're creating a new educational experience that's more expansive. Charlie, tell me what we got. Yes, 2023. We got a lot in store, a lot planned for you guys. So you know that EYLU already includes monthly financial planning calls with me, book club calls with Troy, real estate calls with MG the Mortgage Guy, access to the home buying blueprint, volume one and volume two. Part of the revamp will include 27 local chapters from across the United States, live interactive teaching, hands-on, not just pre-recorded videos, plus 15 brand new curriculums. The biggest just got bigger. So this is not natural. Year one, 4,000. <laughs> Year two, 14,000. Yeah, yeah. Something happened. Steve Harvey, definitely, we can't, we can't, <laughs> Yo, we can't take, crazy. remember yeah. the guy we referenced before? We can't take full credit for this because it's all about partnerships. Yeah. And um, when we met Steve Harvey, he said he wanted to do business with us. So proposed like, well, this is an opportunity that, that you know, maybe you can become a partner with us. And um, he became a partner. So he did a few very pivotal things. A, he came, right? Sure. So he's one of the biggest stars in the world. So putting his name on the bill was extremely helpful. He also got us Tyler Perry. Epic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, now he don't come outside. That changes the word, right? So that that yeah. changes that changes things. And um, we went on his show. And I never forget, like, I, the impact of that. And I don't, never really listened to his morning show. So I didn't really know. I didn't know how impactful his reach was, but it's the number one syndicated morning show in uh -huh. uh, in America. And it's over, I think they have like between six to 10 million weekly um, listeners. Mm. View, like, so he put us on his show. He came on Market Mondays also, which was beneficial, but we went on his show. And after we went on his show, it just never, it, it took off and it never came down. Yeah. No, <laughs> serious. Like it, it was, it's that level of impact mm -hmm. because you got to remember there's an audience that he's talking to, right? Like we might not be listening, but my mom's listening to that every yeah, day. For sure. And he has a certain region of the country that if he does something, they're supporting it. And mm -hmm. so the fact that he was not only our partner, but he was speaking at the event, it just added to it. Plus it just, from an other standpoint, it was like, who else does he have reached to? Yeah. And so, like, that's how you get a Dan Cathy. 
And that's how Dave Shands has an epic conversation with Dan Cap. You see what I'm saying? So it like all these people, like his network is a lot larger than ours. Yeah. But now that he's our partner, we have access to his network. Okay. You know what Let's I mean? back up a little bit. Yeah, because yeah. I don't know if it was, okay, we have 4,000 people at one, and now Steve is like, hey, I want to be your partner. Like, <laughs> how did that come about? Well, when we met him, so we met him, we did an interview with him, right? Which mm-hmm. that became a classic conversation. How did you get that? Uh, th- so it's just, we were um, real close with the the, the talent agent um, at uh, Black Effect, mm-hmm. Nicole Spence, shout out to her. And um, I, she's Jamaican. So we just had this thing. Like I, I'd call her once a week. We just talk, just regular things. Every now and then she was like, yo, I have this person that's interested. They're on the press run. They want to do it. And she called me one day uh, in the summer. And she was like, hey, I got this golf tournament I want you to go to, but I can't tell anybody at Black Effect yet. I'm like, who is it? She was like, Steve Harvey. Um, you, I want you to go there and I want you to do an interview with him, but uh, you can't let anybody know yet. I'm like, ah, whatever. Whatever, I'm cold, like whatever. She's like, no, serious, I'm serious about this. We're getting closer to it. It's in Abu Dhabi, <laughs> right? And I'm like, yo, all right, whatever. I didn't, we didn't go to that golf tournament. She calls me later. She's like, listen. Why not? Well, it didn't, it didn't pan out. The schedules didn't pan out uh, because he wanted, his schedule was kind of crazy. Like he spends like two months out the year out there. And we just, it, it didn't work. But she was like, look, next year, y'all definitely going, but I'm going to put you in contact with his, uh, somebody from his team. His name is Tabidi Stevens. Mm. I'm like, all right, cool. All the dope interview. Spoke to Tabidi. He was like, listen, we love y'all. It's the first time I'm ever speaking to him. He's like, I'm from, we love y'all. We love y'all. I'm from Atlanta. Everybody in Atlanta rocks with y'all. We know what y'all doing. SH is definitely doing the interview. Um, my bad. I was supposed to set it up for y'all to come to Abu Dhabi. It just didn't work. Y'all coming next year for sure. But before that, we got to do this interview. I'm like, all right, bad. This is like November. He's like, I'm like, all right. I'm like, yo, Shadi, they said we're going to interview C. Harvey. He's like, yeah, all right, I'll see when it happens. I'm like, you didn't believe? <laughs> no, I didn't believe. Nah. No, I thought that was always it's not, it's, so I, I, When I, it happens, it happens. I, 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 always, I always like to curb my enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Okay. So I'm like, this is November. I'm like, whatever. Top of the year, I revisited. They're like, yo, you know, First quarter, we're getting this done. January is his birthday month. He travels the whole month of January. We can't do it. Hit me at the top of February. I'm like, I bet. Hit him at the top of February. Yo, we're good? He's like, yeah. February 17th work? I still remember the date. I'm like, that works. Let's do it. He's like, all right, I'll send you the, the, all the information you need to know. Y'all need cameras and anything? I'm like, now nah, we good. He's like, 17th. Make sure y'all come. Mm-hmm. Came 17th. He snapped on that interview, too. And y'all asked all the right questions. Y'all dropped 40. Yeah. Talking, it, it was not stop, bro. It was not stop. Yeah. Like the setups and like the. I mean, you know, you you, you interview people, so you know, it's it's it takes two to dance. You gotta have a dancing partner. Yeah. And a lot of times, people they you know they it, you could be the greatest interviewer in the world, but if the person that you're interviewing isn't into it, mm-hmm. it's not gonna translate well. So it was like, I think we did a, a great job of asking questions, but he did a tremendous. He was fully engaged. Yeah. He wanted to do it. He was, uh, you know, just. Everything about it, from telling jokes to being vulnerable yeah. to giving his life, like he, it's, it's yes, yeah, it's humbling that you say that we did a great job, but it's extremely, we have to give him credit mm. because it was like you know he, it was masterful how he was answering the questions, how he was, you know, going in and out of the topics, how he was ready, he had the bullet points, even like the first question was like your five pillars of success. And that took like 15 minutes because like he was literally went off every five pillars. Like there were so many viral moments in that in that episode. But um he was in the right frame of mind and he was willing to share information that he never shared before. Very um vulnerable in a lot of different spaces. So he did a great job of of relaying the information. It was, was going to take these flowers. Bro. Yeah, take these flowers. <laughs> nah, I'm going to tell you. Sean Kemp is not Sean Kemp. Yeah, nah, 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 nah. Without, without Gary. Gary Pitt. Like, without putting that's the ball in. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. he did it's, some it's, good interviews before. Yeah. It takes two to dance. It's not like that. You got yeah. to have, have a dancing partner. Yeah. So we, we we did our part, but he did his part as well. When, when we left that interview, and I'm sure you probably experienced it, sometimes you leave an interview and you're like, we got one. <laughs> like, we looked at each other right after the interview and we were like, our lives are never going to be the same. Really? Yeah, as soon as we walked out, we Dragging the equipment, we're like, yo, our life's never gonna be the same. What were you basing that off of? The information? Or well, the, the, we had a conversation prior. So before the, the interview, we, we spoke for about maybe an hour and a half. And then we did the interview, which is almost like two hours. And then after the interview, we spoke for another two hours. And based on the conversations we were having in the room, it was like, yo, 
this is the one, but our lives are never going to be the same because he's like, yo, we're getting this done. I'm now going to be your partner in this invest festival. Invest mm -hmm. festival. Let's see how we can scale this thing. We need to have as many people there as possible. I want to have the most impact as possible. So we knew that our lives were going to be the same. But then when we saw it, when the episode came out and him telling us, like after, you know, it, you know, a couple of weeks, a few months after, he was like, this was the most impactful interview that I've ever had in my career in 35 years. Yeah, he don't tell everybody so, that. So, no, no, no. so the, the part, the, here's, the, here's the interesting part, because what you said is right. Like when he goes to do an interview and he had his own talk show, but when he goes to do other people's interviews, it's the same thing. They want to know what he's promoting, how his family is doing, family and theory. can he tell a joke really quick. Yeah. You never get to hear anything else about the business, right? He's building a business empire in front of our faces. Nobody's asking the questions. Yeah. We see him on our television every night in syndication on Family Nobody's asking the questions. And so we were able to do that. Yeah, definitely. He was willing to dance with us and he enjoyed having us there, which made it a lot easier. But it was like both sides. Like we knew it was going to change our lives. And for him, it was like, thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. But I mean, we were gracious to have it. All right, give, me your, give me your perspective from the, our lives will never be the same. No, no. So... He, he didn't commit to InvestFest at that time. He just said that he wanted to work with us. We proposed the InvestFest idea to Tabidi a little bit after that. Um, but, mm. you know, just when you, A, when you go to his house, it's not a regular house. And so <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's an estate. Like they actually, yeah. they take your ID. You like, you got to sign a NDA. Really? Like there's security on the grounds. Like, you know, it's like you're going somewhere. And that's, A, that's the first. His home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take care so of that you. was the first time that I ever went to a house like that. I never, I personally, I never went to a house where I had to sign an NDA and there was a, a guard at the gate with a dog and all of that and walkie talkies and all that and tennis courts and all of that type of stuff. So he really, you know, that was an experience within itself just to actually go there. And um, like you said, the conversation that we had was almost five hours when you add up before mm. the, the interview and the after. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, he's a kingmaker. Like, he has a lot of influence. So when he took a liking to us, and he was saying, like, he wanted to do stuff with us. Like, he wants to do this, he wants to do that. And so I was like, all right, this is going to put us in a, in a in a different stratosphere. And that's what he did. Like, you know, you look at it from an InvestFest standpoint, but even talking about this year's InvestFest with Robert Smith, like, that comes to him. Like, mm -hmm. he, he's the first person that introduced us to Robert Smith in person. Um, mm -hmm. So that was, you know, he's... he made the introduction for Tyler Perry. Like, you know, it took us, we was in Dubai in Abu Dhabi for his golf tournament, you know, Formula One race in Abu Dhabi, different things of that nature. So he's been a, he's been a good dude, but just, you know, you kind of have a, you, if you meet Jay-Z and, you know, you just have a handshake, it's like, all right, that's cool. But then if you meet Jay and he tells you, I want to do business with you. Mm. It's different. You know what I'm saying? Like your life is going to change. Yeah. How, did, how did you pick Invest Fest as the thing we partner on. I mean, it's a bunch of y'all could have created something. Well, it was coming up, and we just felt like that would be a perfect situation. You know, you know. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. So you planned, you had year two Invest Fest planned already. Were you promoting and marketing already? We're putting it together. You're putting it together. So when y'all putting it together, you weren't thinking fourteen thousand. Um, not, initially. not initially. Not initially. I think I think it yeah. might have been ten thousand yeah. originally. He, he, you know, one of the things like and, and to be was saying is because you know, S Stage had a, a a war show that he used to do um, at State Farm. Yo, ask him if I can call him S Stage when I see him too. <laughs> Just why y'all got this Mr. Guy. or Mr. Harvey, <laughs> preferably <laughs> Mr. Harvey. Did. And he was like, we were telling him like what we were kind of thinking. He was like, man, y'all should do twenty thousand. Y'all should do State Farm. I'm like, yeah, we, we got to grow to that. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? like, we got to figure out how we're going to do it. It's like, nah, y'all definitely can do it. We already have connections. We have all the relationships. We used to do our own um, award show um, for entrepreneurs, and it was like a comedy thing. They were telling us the blueprint on how they were doing it. They were like, yo, yeah, y'all can get this done. Y'all definitely can get this done. It was like, all right, well, let's figure out how we can get it done. So it wasn't like a number, but it was like kind of idea like, all right, well, they, they got a firm belief, and they have relationships. So how do we make this work? I think something lends to that too. Somebody who just has a, a bigger view, like they're just bigger thinkers, right? Like, I mean, I watch you all, and like you guys give me the belief that I could do something that I wouldn't even thought of, mm. right? Like, so I always ask, like, yo, what's your downloads? Yeah. And I think one time he was like two million. I was like, oh my gosh, two million a month. <laughs> 
I think I could do it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and then like as you as you start connecting with people who just have a bigger vision, you're like, oh, no doubt, I can do that. So yeah, now I'm starting to understand this whole 2023 20, 20,000 number. <laughs> it just makes sense at this point. See, it makes sense. yeah, but then I like even for that, like we've had those conversations. It was like, how many downloads? What are the analytics? But then I'm gonna show you how you get to that. That's the biggest difference because mm. I could just tell you that we're doing 10 million. Wow, how's he doing that? Yeah. Not like yo. Here's how you do it. How many episodes do you have? You got a back catalog? You know what I mean? Like we just have these conversations. Like, oh, if, when I look at it like that, that seems very attainable. Yeah. So like when they start breaking down like how you can get it done and who you can get and who's what corporate relationships you can have that can be involved and in, like yo, my publicist works with that person and we can get it. It's yeah. like, oh yeah, we can reach that number. And I think okay, we got uh, Mr. Harvey on. I was about to I almost slip. I almost said that's it. We got Mr. Harvey on, but. Even still, to get that many people, there's still some work to be done. So I want to know, like, all the work that goes into providing this experience for people. Well, it's a lot of work. Um, and the key, I think, in any type of, when you, especially when you work with somebody like that, you don't want to abuse it because mm -hmm. it's like people are busy. So for us, it's like, all right, it's like riding a bike, right? If you have a kid, like you, you push, you push somebody on the bike, and it's up to you to pedal. Yeah, like you know what I'm saying. So he gave us a push, but it's up to us to pedal. For sure, we can't, you know, expect him to do all of the leg work. So the leg work part of it is what all of us had to do from Mike, myself, Troy, Matt, Abdullah, um, Ashley, our event planner, um, his wife Danielle, every you know everybody on our team. Um, Burke making the flyers for us, uh, North 13th and mm -hmm. Create making mm -hmm. the videos for us. Um, well, what does it look like for you? You know you're gearing up for <laughs> um, for something massive, right? It's like a fight. Like, you got to, you know, it's like, I, you know, get in fight mode. Like a fighter, you know, he trained for six weeks before he go into before yeah. the day in camp. So it's like, I, you know, lock down. So for us, like, you know, press, doing press, that's, that's a big part of it. You know, flying all over, doing different interviews, like having this conversation, like that's part of it. Um, doing Zoom calls. Um, the good thing is that we have a lot of great relationships. I was going to say. So that. booking the talent, here's the blueprint of how you do these type of events, right? So A, you have to find a venue, mm -hmm. right? You find a venue and then you put the deposit down, you secure the venue, right? You have to work with an event planner that actually can make this come to fruition as well. Hold that point real quick. What did y'all spend last year? I've been dying to ask you. Um, what did it cost you to put on? It probably cost like a million, probably. At one These guys are putting a million dollars down to yeah. make sure you have a great great experience. 1.3, but who's one, counting? Who's counting? <laughs> Extra 300,000. 1.3 million to provide an experience. This is, and and I think it's important that people come to see what excellence looks like. Okay, so find event planner. But let me give you some game on that too, because I don't want to discourage people. It did cost. I'm discouraged. It, it did cost over a million dollars, <laughs> but that's why it's important to get um, your payment processing platform. That's important, whoever you pick, because it was like you know, the payment processing platform that we used at that time, which we're not using them now, but they paid us daily, mm. so. As we get paid, then now we can pay for stuff as well. So you got to have working capital. Yeah. So it's like if you don't have a million dollars in the bank or if you don't have a loan, then, you know, to be able to receive funds on a daily basis is beneficial because as you as the money comes in, now you can write checks and the money's going out at the same time. So that's important to know from a financial aspect if you're thinking about doing these type of events. But from the venue the event planner, um, you have to curate the event. You have to get the people. So that, like I said, luckily for us, we don't, we, we, even now to this day, we don't go through like talent agencies and it's not mm -hmm. corporate. Like this is personal people that we know. Even Diddy, I can mm -hmm. tell that story if you're interested, but this, that's a personal relationship that we developed and I hit them personally. I didn't go through, you know, UTA and shout out to them, but we didn't go through those channels. Like every single person, like we got personal relationships yeah. and the people change every year as well. So people that was on last year is not on this year. People that saw on the first year, like, so it's different people. So we constantly meet new people and we yeah. constantly develop new relationships. 
So first it's like, okay. Can I say something really quick? Because that's important. You know the best way to build a relationship? What's that? Interview them. Right? Mm. Because now you've given them a platform, their audience has seen it, and it's exposed them to a newer audience. Yeah. And so a lot of times, if you look at the people that's on the list, they've had some sort of contact with the network. Either it was on our show, or they came on Market Mondays, or Rants and Jams, or they on High Level. At some point, they had a relationship with the network where they would be in an interview. And so now you have a relationship. Gotcha. And so now the ask is a lot easier, right? Because, yeah, we had this platform, and we shared you with the world, right? Your, your greatness. But like, hey, are you interested in, in talking to the audience again? Yeah. Makes it an easier ask. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So you, you put together the, the blueprint of what you want. All right, we want a real estate panel. We want a stock panel. We want a keynote speaker. We want a panel on, you know, content creation. And then you just fill it in. Like, who do I Someone know? Someone teaching on podcasting. For sure. That's a fact. I'll see you guys this year. That is a fact. <laughs> that is a fact. Dave Shands with the three C. in August. <laughs> so, so yeah. So you just you just fill in the fill in the pieces. It's like, okay, this this person will be good for real estate. This person will be good for content creation. And like I said, fortunately for us, we know a lot of people. So it's just personal phone calls, text messages. And um, most people, like people don't really say no to us for the most part. You know, they might have a scheduling conflict or they might not be able to make it. But for the most part, that's that's the easy part. Hard part is like getting like the big names. Yeah. Like, you know, but that wasn't really difficult this year. We was able, fortunately, we, we was able to get some big names early and lock that in early. Music is the hard part. We can talk about that if you're interested. Mm -hmm. That's the hardest part. Music is harder than getting names? Yeah, yeah it's musicians is the hardest part. Why? Because a they they come with the most baggage. Talk to him, Kitty Birds. It's real. Nah, it's, it's real. It's real. Nah, it's, that's a they, fact. They, 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 come, riders be ridiculous. they come with the most baggage. Nine times out of ten, you, you can't go through them directly. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of people we could just go through directly. Like, I need mm -hmm. you here. All right. Them, you gotta talk to their manager, and then their manager's manager, and then they, it's, it's and then they're, yeah, like their writers, and yeah. they don't know their schedule. They might be on tour, they might not be on. Like, just give me an answer. <laughs> they put you in limbo for weeks at a time. They Can't don't get back to right you. now. So the music, that's that's, need, that's a I need headache. Forty bottles of that is a headache, man. <laughs> to music, not. I mean, some musicians like shout out to Ross. Mm -hmm. He's that's easy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That good dude. So it's not it's not every musician yeah. that is bad like that, but a lot of them, a lot of them, <laughs> man. Yeah, unless so like Ross makes it easier because we've sat down with him before. All right. We interviewed him at him for Hunter's yeah. event. We did it on a, um assets of liabilities. So there's a relate. He knows who we are, yeah. right? Same thing with Tip. We call Tip. It's gonna be an easier call because Did I CTI on there. Nah, no. Nah. Wait, 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 nah. wait. Just wait on it. Just wait on it, Because when I saw Jeezy's name, I was like, yo, I was thinking of all my favorite songs. And I don't ever think I've seen him in concert. So this is really giving me a chance to like see people in concert. That was my first time actually in Vest Fest watching Rick Roth perform. That was a hell of a And he's song. right in front of me. I, I said, this I, is and it, and, and I, it was, I was, I was going to say it's the first time you get to see me perform. <laughs> But <laughs> that, was, we, we, that was a hell of a performance. That was crazy. Shout, yeah. shout out to Rose. He went Ray. above and beyond. I mean, all, like Kiss, Kiss, he did a great performance for us at mm -hmm. MSG. Yep, relationships. Yep. Um, so it is beneficial to book artists that are familiar with us. Mm -hmm. That makes it easier. Like we did Jim and at the Apollo. Mm -hmm. That's easy. But yeah, you know, these artists, man, they got a lot. They got a lot, man. But you know what's so crazy? You know what's so crazy? So we booked several different billionaires, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, from Dan Cathy to Don Peebles to Tyler Perry to Robert Smith to Diddy as well. Um, Novogratz. Mike Novogratz. You know what's so crazy? Especially from the... Well, Diddy hasn't sent a rider yet either, but mm. we've never received a rider for, from a billionaire. Mm. Yeah, one, one. Tyler Perry's rider was... It was... It was he, I want I, like a haircut, and bananas, bananas and apple juice, water, like, like water. Like, the man, simplest thing. Minimal, minimal. We never received any demands or crazy requests from billionaires. Yo, Dan Cathy, I'm talking about owner of Chick fil A. He's walking around. But, but by himself. With a name tag. I walked you into but, him. But, but no. with a, a name tag on. Yeah. But the crazy what thing, but, but the crazy thing about it is this is I don't know where this writer thing came from. <laughs> that's a musician thing. <laughs> KB, that's a that's a musician thing, right? No, but I'm just saying yeah. it's like some things we just don't question. Cause I just thought about that today. I'm like, we book 
a bunch of um, people in business, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, athletes, um, whatever. Why does why do musicians only have writers? I think it's really? it, it, I think <laughs> the origin comes from it's from music, but it's what they um, would like to feel comfortable when they get to a venue. Mm -hmm. Which is, all right, I get it. But some of the things is like, yo, 20 bottles of champagne, I'm not sure if that's going to make you feel comfortable if you're going to be there for 15 minutes. <laughs> but the, you know what I'm saying? So like some of the things, it's just like. But the problem is that they get coddled too. And a lot, of, a lot of them don't, they don't, they're not handling their own business. Mm. So it's like, because like, let's really just, let's have a two minute conversation about this. Because I just thought about this today. Why, why is a writer needed if nobody else has a writer? Right? What? Like, <laughs> do you ever think about that? Nobody else has a writer. Right. Right? Like, if Don People doesn't have a writer, what? You come to a venue, you're gonna be in a green room. You can expect that there's gonna be food there for you. Yeah. There's gonna be water. There's gonna be juice. There's gonna be beverage. If you have a special request that you might have, you might want, you know, a halal meal, then we can accommodate that, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm just curious to know why musicians are the only people that have writers. And the writers are alcohol, mm -hmm. at a tremendous amount of alcohol that you can't consume. So it's like, if you have 10 <laughs> bottles of champagne, and, no, hey, it's like, it's like a tremendous amount of alcohol that you can't No, but it's ridiculous. It's like, I, I, who normalized this? Yeah. Right. And I realized that it's from the nightclub. Most of them, you know, mm -hmm. this, these come from nightclubs, right? Where they just go to a nightclub and it's like, but it's, we gotta really start to think about this. Yeah. Yeah. Why are we providing, if we're paying you for a service, mm -hmm. then you should just be paid for a service. Yeah. Yeah. You, you shouldn't be paid for a service and have 15 bottles of tequila at five o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah. If you wanna buy tequila, then you buy tequila. <laughs> That's yeah. the check I'm giving you. <laughs> Organic flavored hummus. <laughs> and, then, like, and then you want your money in cash. There's a variety of different things that make this a lot more difficult yeah. dealing with musicians, which I understand why. Like concert promoters, they got a hard job because now you got to deal with a hundred. Like say Rolling Loud, they got to deal with a hundred artists. Oh, hundred writers. Imagine that. And yes, and, <laughs> and, <laughs> right. that. and and if you got a hundred of them, now you got to worry about the punctuality of it. No, that's mm -hmm. another thing, right? Because the thing is, like now, yeah, I booked you and you're supposed to be, but now I need you to be here on time. They never come on time. And if you're not on time. <laughs> There's this audience of twelve thousand people that are waiting for you to be there, or twenty thousand. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it's like it's just it's it's. I'm concerned because it's like this has become normalized and it's just past. It's normal. It's normal for rappers. You gotta tell a rapper to come two hours early because you know he's gonna come at least an hour and a half late. Mm. But nobody ever questions that. Yeah. Nobody else does that. I like the fact that you guys are like even right now educating on it and really challenging the system because I think as you're talking about it, I'm like, yo, this is. Real and maybe we had to put extra time on your thing. Remember, we kept running your time back. We had to put <laughs> extra time. <laughs> you, you thought you was tripping out, and I'm like, yo, Dave, we just yeah. Yo. I was like, yo, I know I saw that clock. It said five it was, minutes, then it jumped right. to fifteen, and then it got down to seven, and we yeah. put it back to twelve. Shout, <laughs> and you're like, that was for we Fab. were doing some time issues. Shout, shout out to Fab, good dude. Right. Um, he's actually a great dude, but it is what it is. He's three hours late <laughs> <laughs> on five o'clock on a Sunday, so we're wait, we're stalling. Mm -hmm. Literally, when he got there, he, we put the microphone, gave him the money. They counted it. He, he cash. He walked on stage and performed <laughs> like cash. Yeah, cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we cash, we, cash we, on we literally like <laughs> cash on delivery. We going back and forth with like where y'all at? Where y'all at? Da, 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 da. Like they like oh, five minutes away. Pulling up half an hour later. Five minutes away. Half an hour later. Five minutes away. So I, I, you, you <laughs> was on stage. They spent thirty minutes. They said we 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 on the grounds. I said they said building B. We trying to find it. 25 minutes. <laughs> I'm like, bro. <laughs> Yo, we like, put more time on. Put 15 minutes on. Keep put going, 10 dude. minutes on. Put another 15 minutes on. We had to keep adding time. We gave you the MVP award after that. Hey, man. If it's it, all if good. It I got it. it. <laughs> hey, listen. If it wasn't Just put me on right before any artist, okay? Yo, I'll handle it. If it wasn't for that, we would have been... We, we, I don't know what we would have done. That time, the DJ would have been playing. Because <laughs> there was no other program. That was yeah. the last thing of the day. Right. Yeah. So we would have just had a... Just, 30 minutes of just nothing, an hour of nothing. Crowd, we were doing uh, swag serving for 30 what, minutes. That's <laughs> you, know, fat Yo, you guys are really like, this is this. But is, that's why you got to give artists Fat Joe. Fat Joe really, really impressed me. When we interviewed him in, in Miami, mm -hmm. he impressed me for a few different reasons. So we had him and we had Master P right after. I think he was at the Master P mm -hmm. one. Yep. So we did Fat Joe before we did Master P. 
the interview, let's say, was at like two o'clock, right? So we we spaced it where it was like Master P, we'll do Master P at six because we know if the interview's at two, he's not gonna come till three. Because mm-hmm. we just think he's just a, a rapper. Yeah. A, he comes at 155. Mm. And B, he came by himself. That's another thing. These dudes be coming with 30 people, <laughs> yeah. 25 people. It was crazy. And, and you got to accommodate. session is crazy, right? Yeah, it's like, it's, it was ridiculous. And it's, everybody's yeah. smoking. And it's it's not even the, the place to smoke necessarily. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? There's a time and place for everything. Yo, it was crazy. Like, the, the Joe story is crazy because they're calling. I'm calling on the phone. I'm like, yo, where's he at? I'm looking for an entourage. They said, nah, he's in that car right there. Uh, he's about to get out. I look, it's just him. I'm like, we have to... Yeah, and that's like, impressive. Just him. And he had like 300,000 worth of jewelry on. Well, I was going to leave that part out, but... <laughs> no, nah, he, he said it. He said it. Yeah, I mean, that's just how he moved. He, it was just like, it was just him. He came to the interview. He showed love. And it was, that was it. And again, a relationship. So if we ever had to call on Joe, it's like, all right, well, he knows who we are. I've never seen that before. Whatever. I've never... He's the only person I've ever seen a rapper that, yeah. that came... He literally came by himself. Well, Kiss came on time. Shout out to Kiss. No, Kiss came by himself. But yeah. He came, he came on time. time, but he didn't come by himself. Yeah. He came by himself. Yeah. yeah, that was impressive. I like that we're having this conversation because it's educational too, and and our our culture needs like shaping, right? These no, types it, of conversations, it's, it's correction. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's not it's not meant to 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 bash anybody, but if we if we don't correct these these things, then we start to normalize dysfunction. Yeah, and it's like I feel like we have a voice, we have a platform, and we have credibility in the street. Like we are hip hop. Yeah. So it's like this is this is a family conversation. Yeah. So it's like we have to correct these things because it leads to be it leads to getting taken advantage of. Yeah. It leads to not knowing doing bad business because how you do one thing is how you do everything. Yeah. So if you don't if you're not on top of it, if you're late, if you're always high, if you got a, a million people around you, these are formulas yeah. for disaster. Yeah. So it's like this is a bigger conversation, but the artist need to understand it. And there's not, there's artists like La Russell, like there's, there's a new generation of artists that are changing that that mold, yeah. but it needs to be done more on a wider scale. Yeah. So it's like, this is a this is a formula that record labels have put in place for artists. Yeah. And they give you a manager and they give you a stylist and they, and they give you a rider. You don't even know, you you don't know why you're doing these things. It's just been told to you. Mm-hmm. Like you know what I'm saying? Like this is what you're supposed to do. This is what this is what we're gonna negotiate for you. This is what you get. You come to the, the club late. They tell them like, yo, come to the club late, fashionably late. You know, come, late. come at two o'clock. That's a thing. Come at two o'clock. These are things club that close at two thirty. This 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 is not <laughs> honest. It's real. So this is how they're being educated. So like I said, how you do everything is how you do one thing is how you do everything. So if you if you're told don't come to the club until 1.30, then you thinking, I'm supposed to be late. Yeah. So it's a business event, I'm supposed to be late. You just, you automatically think that late is on time because yeah. I'm an artist and I can't come on time. But the crazy thing is when we interviewed Robert Smith, who's the richest black person in American history, it was on a Friday at seven o'clock in the morning at, at and he came at 6.50. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? A.M. So A.M. Yeah. So it's like, this is a person that's up $8 billion. And he's up with a three-piece suit on early. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so it's like, sure. these are the kind of things. Never ask for a shot of tequila. Yeah. You're drinking coffee. No. <laughs> like, yeah. you know what I'm that's it. That's the request. That's the rider. Give me some coffee. So like, it's, it's like, and it, that, that happens. Like, you see like a lot of these artists who have longevity. Like, we just saw uh, Luda. He's on tour with Janet, right? Yeah. There's like this thing going around like, yo, don't show up late to the show. They're going on on time. It's like... Yeah, they are. Yeah. If you show up at 7.45, he's on the stage at 7.45 in one second. Yeah. Because he understands the value of his time, but he understands the value of everybody else's time too. You pay for a service. I'm here to entertain. I don't want to hold, have you sitting here for two hours waiting for me to come out. And Jet is going to be on clockwork yeah. too. And so he, they understand it, but they're long, they have longevity in the space, right? And so like, if he's setting that trend and nobody's following it and nobody's bringing awareness to it, does it ever change? Mm. You know what I mean? Mm, this is important. This, and all the people that are like coming, they're going to come enjoy the show, but have no idea that you guys, from this conversation, you're teaching from the stage, but you're also teaching behind the scenes. Yeah. Like you're teaching 
Like you're teaching the artist how to operate. And nobody would ever think that before this moment. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That I'm sure there's certain conversations that you have to have like, yo, I'm going to need you on time. Or, yeah. you know I mean? or you just jump. You tell them two hours early. You yeah. do different things. You do different tactics to kind of, you know, ensure that you don't get screwed. Because yeah. ultimately, it's, it's not in your best interest for somebody to be late. Yeah. So you got to have yeah. certain incentives or certain different things of that nature. So you kind of learn that early. Like when you work with an artist, all right, this is how I got to talk to them. This is how yeah. I got to handle this person. 20, yeah. 2023. It's happening. Um, Diddy is the first name on the flyer. Sean Cone. Shout out to Diddy. Sean Cone. Love. Love, 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 love. I got so excited because I know what y'all do in terms of like curating a conversation. And I really honestly believe this interview will be like no other interview. I don't even think any of the other people, for one, he don't do a lot of interviews. Mm -hmm. But the people that interviewed him, I think were, are more focused on pleasing him in the interview to promote. But what I'm excited about is to see all the questions that you guys are gonna ask that we have been wanting to know for years, mm-hmm. for decades. It's a lot of questions that that need to be asked um, about you know, his rise to become a billionaire, that's impressive. Yeah. Um, his, his ability to reinvent himself from music to spirits, to fashion, to whatever. Um, his ability to stay relevant for 30 years. Yeah. His, you know, there's been questions as far as what artists that said that, that they were uh, taking advantage of different things of that nature, right? These are legitimate questions to be, and I'm sure he has his own point of view. We just haven't heard it. Mm-hmm. We've heard Mace, we heard a variety of other artists that have been disgruntled, Yeah. but we haven't heard it from his side. Yeah. We haven't heard like, no, this is the education that they, they, they missed. Yeah. This is what they, you know, like this is his side of the story. Mm-hmm. It's important yeah. because you know, no matter how you feel about him, he's an important person in our culture. Yeah, for sure. And he's played a tremendous part. And um, I got to give credit to 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 Dion though. Dion, it's always the people that you don't know who's the most important people. Mm. So it's like Tabidi. We talked about him with Steve Harvey. Dion is like his right hand man, and Dion has been somebody that's been watching Earn Your Leisure for years and has been advocating us to him mm-hmm. for years. He's been advocating wow. it for years. So, um, and it was other people inside of the, the revolt and you know his enterprise as well. But Dion was, like, has been in his ear for years. Sanders. No, 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 Dion Sanders. Okay, Dion. I'm trying to yeah, yeah, understand yeah, yeah. the guys like that. Shout out to Prime I know we know a lot of Dion. <laughs> shout out to Prime <laughs> Shout That's all I got that too, but not nah, his <laughs> name is Dion Graham. Okay. And I'm not sure of his exact title, but he's like high level executive at Coleman Enterprises. Right. He's like Diddy's like, you know, go to person to oh, a variety no. of different things. So he was telling him, he told, he was the first person to probably tell Diddy about us. And he has been telling him about us for a very long period of time. So um, by the time we actually, you know, it was already a warm vibe. Yeah. Obviously, we, you know, the relationship will revolt, but then from Dion too. So, um, that's important because I wanted to acknowledge him because mm-hmm. yeah. a lot of times those type of people don't get acknowledged. Nobody yeah, yeah. really knows who they are, yeah. but these these types of situations just don't happen out of thin air. Yeah, yeah. There's somebody that's usually always behind the scenes that's advocating for it and that's playing the middleman in mm-hmm. this situation. And that's exactly what he has done and what he is currently doing to this day. So uh, he's a good dude. He, he's the guy that we just spoke about, right? We're not yeah. talking about the CFO of Bad Boy. I've mm-hmm. been doing this for 20 years. Nobody's ever asked me. Like yeah. this is these are the people you need to know because he has such an important role. He has so much information, but who's giving him the outlet right. to speak on that information? Right. So it's, it's important, like even now, just giving him this, this moment because he is important to anything for us being at Revolt, for us getting the Diddy conversation. All of that happens because he plays a role. The Tavio played a role. But I want to go back to the other part about Puff is that he wants to do it, mm. right? Like on the message, I'm sure Shia will talk about it, but on, on the voice note he left, he was like, time is now. Like yeah. the time is now. So all these things that people have been saying, this is the time. Yeah. I, I, I want to show why it's important. You know, I want to give them the blueprint on how this happened, right? I want to speak about wealth. I want to speak about how we bridge this gap from knowledge and education to wealth. Right, like now is the time to do it. And to know that he felt like we would be the trusted place, 
Yeah. I mean, that just adds to it, right? Yeah. And we have a, a, a track record. Like, it wasn't like, hey, this is your first one. Nah, you guys have done some some really good work. I've been mm-hmm. watching it. I've seen it on my network. I can see what it's doing. Yeah, This is the place. Because yeah, um, y'all definitely made a good point. He don't be at the Revolt events. You know what I mean? <laughs> but he's coming. <laughs> well, That's yeah, I mean, we have a show. He has, I mean, that was one of the things we were like, yo, we got to get him on an episode. This yeah. is ass is over. Like, we got to have him on the episode. We've been saying this since the first episode. Yeah. And it was like, nah, the time and the time and the time. And like, all right, well, the time's going to come. Yeah. We're just going to leave one episode on the deal if we don't get it. So it was like him saying, like, the time is now. I was like, yo, that paraphrases everything. Because it's like, the, it's the thing we saw. Like, he became a billionaire. And we just yeah. had this conversation. But like, he's first generation. He didn't really get the announcement though. It what exactly? It what? Why? You know what I mean? Why? That's what I, I I was want. Even when y'all said it, yeah. I mean, I act like I knew it, but the billionaire. Yeah. I don't think he. You know, it's an inter- he's an interesting person. I don't think that he's gotten the the same level of reverence that Jay Z has gotten. I agree. Because yeah, yeah I, I was like, he didn't. You know, normally Jay Z got the yo billionaire. They so what, calculated everything. What was Jay's first line? I came into the game wanting more money than Puff. Yeah. So Puff's been doing this for that long. Yeah. That his his first goal when he was right, like this is like early two thousands, like I want more money than Puff. Then I realized Puff paid being enough, and then it was like, all right, well we're back in this thing together, and it was like, yeah, that's right. But he's been doing it. Yeah. He's you, been why, doing it in different in different spaces. Why do you think that? Why do you think he hasn't been? Obviously he's celebrated, but why do you think that the reverence has not been the same? I. I think it has it hasn't been the same because people have mixed feelings about but, Diddy. It's almost like everyone loves Jay Z, mm-hmm. right? Um, Kanye yeah. is the one that's going to tell you he's a billionaire, right? Mm-hmm. Diddy's not necessarily the person that's going to say I'm that, right? So I think it just it's just I I, I don't know. It's uh I don't know. I don't know. Why do you it, think? It's I don't know. It's, I think it's, I think I think it, it comes down to that. There's a lot of Question marks? The disgruntled, the disgruntled um, former artist. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. that that's a part of his legacy. Yeah. And I think that that's something that has permeated mm-hmm. and has been synonymous. Whether it's right, wrong, fair, whatever. Yeah. Um, I think Baby from Cash Money has mm-hmm. a similar type of situation. Because mm-hmm. if you look at Baby, I don't think that he gets enough respect. Yeah. I don't think he gets enough reference either. Um, we put him number one on our list and we had a lot of pushback from that, but I'm like, who has a run like him? But I think when you see a lot of artists from Cash Money or people that have worked with Cash Money that said that they didn't get paid and that they it was, you know, some shaky business practices, I think the public takes a side. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It, it takes a side in it. Without even knowing all the information, they take a side. And Jay has done something because Jay has had disgruntled artists as well. Yes. Nah, he had a lot of... Really. This, this, this the, whole part, state, the whole state property, all of them at one point, have, except for Freeway. I never heard Freeway, Freeway say anything yeah. bad about him. But mm-hmm. all the state property at one point was disgruntled, including Beanie Siegel, who was his guy. Uh, Kanye West has taken multiple shots at Jay throughout the mm-hmm. throughout the, the course of the years. Um, a mill. I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but this been, but Jay has been able to stay clean. Yeah, for sure. Jay, I don't know how he does it, but he <laughs> has a he has a very unique ability to stay clean, even when you're throwing mud on him. Yeah, and maybe because he doesn't speak a lot, it's a nostalgic that you feel for him yeah. because he's he's kind of like a ghost. But um, no matter what, because people have said negative things about Jay from the Colin and Kaepernick, there have been negative yeah. um, propaganda that has been put on Jay, but it hasn't worked. Right. The way it's worked for other people. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, for Jay sure. has, has remained clean for almost 25 years, even with the R. Kelly thing. Like, he's never really been in a situation where it was like, let's cancel Jay Z. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I, what, I mean, there's a part of it that's true, but I think there's a part of it that, again, we, we kind of normalize greatness. Mm-hmm. And so when, when Puff has done things, we've watched him over the long term, right? We've watched. Obviously, the music, but we've watched Sean John in the clothing, and we watched the spirits, and they've been great for so long, right? Yeah. He just got Sean John back, but even that that deal is like some. We there's a conversation around it, but yeah. he's done the spirits for so long, and and while he's been doing it, we've seen the lifestyle, 
we've seen a lifestyle. So like the fact that he's reached it, it's like, oh, we already expected him to be there. Yeah. Whereas with like Jay, it's it's he's doing these investments and it feels sexy because he's doing them. It's like, mm -hmm. yo, LVMH, oh man, that's crazy. He just sold it. Oh, he did the yeah. Bacardi deal. This is right, like they're happening in front of us, like real time when there's social media and there's more emphasis on it. Whereas when Puff did the Deleon deal, it was like, well, we didn't really know that it and it works with it, yeah. but it sounds good. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? Sure, but sure. the expectation for them was like, we've seen him since he was 21 years old. Yeah. He's multi-millionaire then in 1995, 96. Yeah. The fact that he's getting to this point, you know, it's like, all right, I felt like the expectation of it was was, was like part of the reason was like the reverence isn't as much. It's like yeah. for 10 years ago, did people know who Robert Smith was? No. But he's been doing it, right? He's been doing these things, right? People still don't even know who Dave Stewart is. I don't know who Dave Stewart is. That's right. He's the second wealthiest black man in the country. Man. But we don't even know him. It's not sexy, right? Yeah. And the expectations are not there. But it's like, no, these people need to be recognized for the business, right? Yes, the entertainment is great. But there's business that's going on. Yeah. They didn't make it from music. Music was the thing that catapulted them to open up other opportunities. But it came from spirits, yeah. right? It came from fashion. It came from investing. Those are the things that are, are making them reach these these lists. Man. When we talk about this, when we talk about the Walmart family, like you brought mm -hmm. up, I told you the difference, right? There's generational and the sustainable. We need to have both. Yeah. It's like, yeah, they did it off of entertainment and they have spirits. Well, what happens in the next generation doesn't want to do it in spirits? Yeah. What does that look like? Do they? So this is it. Like the time is now. It is now because now he's 54 years old. What's your legacy look like? Man, yo, I. I know we gotta wrap up. Like I, I got so many questions. I'll just ask you. Like, I want to know what y'all talked about at Diddy's house because that was the, <laughs> that was the meanest thing y'all could have did for, the, for Instagram. Like it was just these sneaks and peeks, and I'm like, yo, what is happening over there? And I was watching. Like, yo, this is something's happening. I don't know what's happening, but something's happening. Something. But yes, man, Invest Fest 2023. Yeah. This is going to be an epic, epic event. Um, and anytime you can put uh, 20,000 people in the room, and for me, um, we got great, uh, great uh, speakers, great artists, but the value, I think, is in the other 20,000. Absolutely. You know I mean? The networking. So, yep. the networking. Yep. Yep. Be prepared. Come prepared. You need to start working on your networking skills right now because this is going to be... Um, a gold mine. That's a fact. You never know. And yo, it's it's millionaires, multi-millionaires. I'm talking about just there. There. I'm sitting, I'm sitting last year, and it was a dude that like owns a nine-figure company behind me, just learned with his notebook. I said, <laughs> but, <laughs> happenstance. What's happening here? Yeah. <laughs> What's happening? How many hey, people man. like that there though? Uh thousands. 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 No, that's yeah, where fact. else can that happen? That's a fact. Yeah, so really if you if you watch any podcast episode, it's probably a good chance that that person's going to be in the building. So if you watch any EY episode, <laughs> just come prepared, like with you. I don't know if you got a pitch, if you got a, a business card, if you just, just come be likable. Okay. And some people ain't for the networking. You just want to gather information. That's cool too. But I think you all have done an amazing job of curating a staple in our culture. I'm talking about black, you go to a black enterprise event. 10 years ago, that's the staple. Mm. Now it's 700 people. No shout, no no shade, but <laughs> this is different. Yeah, this so is different. Yeah. So yeah. Um, shouts out to you gentlemen, man. Uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, come on and just uh, uh, really, really get the information on what's happening behind this cultural phenomenon, man. Thank you, brother. Appreciate thank you that, for man. facilitating this conversation. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, thank you for all the work that you've done and always saying yes whenever we ask you for something. And, um, you know, much continued success on your journey, your event, your your network, um, and keep keep inspiring and, and mm -hmm. keep teaching people because it's important. The education part, I think, is extremely important, especially when it comes to our space as far as mm -hmm. the media. I don't think that there's enough education. It's just a lot of trial and error. So, it's great to see, you know, you actually filling that void as far as teaching people. That's important. Everybody on my yeah. network is kind of like your grandchildren. Yeah. <laughs> nah, that's important. <laughs> you know and, yeah, nah, it's Shout important. out to the squad. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah, thank you again. But that uh, a lot of people, like, will get lost in that. Like, like yeah. yeah, you are on Earned Network and you had an idea to say, like, I have something... 
that I want to expand on and build on on my own. And y'all supported. And it was like, yeah, yo, if you want to do that, go ahead. And it wasn't like, yo, we're never doing anything with him again. He left the network. It was like, all right, let's help him still build because he's so great at what he does. If he can be part of something, let's make sure that he is. And so, like, we always talk about collaboration over competition, but it's like, nah, if there's a situation where it can help. Like you said, when we ask you to do anything, it's always like, how can I help? And how can I still be a service? And so, like, people can see that. It's, it doesn't have to be a dispute. It doesn't have to be any friction or any awkwardness. It's like, nah, if we can help, we're going to. Uh, so thank you for facilitating this. Never opposed and, and, to coming back home, guys. <laughs> got a spot. Somebody Never call Mike. Opposed to coming back home. Got a spot. Yeah, man. yeah. Uh, appreciate it, man. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, get your tickets at bestfest.com. Yeah. Like you said, 20,000 people this year. We got, lit, lit. of course, Diddy, Robert Smith. But even outside that, Junior Bridgman, he's he's almost a billionaire. He's $600 million up. You know, Rich Rich Paul, um, you know, Ray Lewis, Steve St uh, Ian Dunlap, 19 Keys. Um, you know, a variety of different people from Jada, um, Sheaves, uh, Ari Fletcher. Oh, wow. Um, you know, wanted to have a very eclectic yeah. group of people. So you got Ari and you got Mike Novogratz, you know? And it's like, <laughs> and, they're, and they're both important. Yeah. yeah. And they're both important. So it's like, you know, let's, let's, let's really incorporate the entire culture, you know, musical performances, Jeezy, Ja Rule. Um, I want to have more women there this year as well. So we got be some, yeah. and we got a podcast stage this year. I don't think I mentioned that. So we yeah. got a podcast day, first time ever. So we got um, my boy Jonathan from Finesse's Only Club. Mm -hmm. We got uh, B. Simone. They, we got, they, um, we got, who else we got? We got um, Millionaire Mindset. Millionaire Mindset, the, the God, God show. show. So that's a, that's a new experience that we're going to have this year as the podcast stage. Yeah. And that is exciting. So check did, us out, man. Did, did we say we're not done? Oh yeah, some yeah. more, some oh, more. And we're not, add, we always add people. And we're not, we're not done. I mean, that, this is the the first wave. First wave. <laughs> I, have, I have some. some yes, yeah, so keep keep some things in the top. Keep some bullets in the clip. Hey, <laughs> hey guys, put in your vacation hours now. Please. Okay, Please. don't play with it. Don't let this be the thing that your job saying. Put in your vacation hours now. Pronto. Pronto. Yeah, love man. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Ski.